can go now. And heaven help you. Have you ever felt controlled by your animal side? Do you ever lose to your worst urges? Does it ever feel as though you're losing grip on your very own humanity as time goes on? If so, then The Wolfman might be just the film for you. The film takes place in Wales, following Larry Talbot, as he returns to his father's prestigious castle, expected to take on the role of caretaker following the passing of his brother. Having been in America for 18 years, Larry is unfamiliar with Wales and his father's town specifically, so he takes some time getting to know the locals. His first target of interest being a woman working at a nearby antique shop. He meets the woman, Gwen, who he quickly becomes fond of and tries to court pretty fast. You know, I haven't had my fortune told in years. How about tonight? No. Fine, I'll be here at eight. Eventually, they take a nighttime stroll together when they and a friend named Jenny go to the outskirts of town to have their fortunes told by the local gypsies. As Jenny's being told her future, Larry and Gwen take a walk into the woods, where he works his charm on her some more. But quickly, Larry learns of Gwen's engagements to another man, and shortly thereafter, hears the startling noises of a wolf. As he gets closer, he can see that the beast is mauling Jenny. Quickly, Larry rushes to kill the wolf with a cane bought from the antique store. He's able to bash its head in, but not before it manages to bite him. From here on out, Larry begins to experience strange symptoms. For one, his bite mark from the wolf heals the next morning, and for another, he experiences excessive hair growth on his feet and legs, a precursor to his full body transformation into a lycanthrope or werewolf. It's a technical expression for something very simple. The good and evil in every man's soul. In this case, evil takes the shape of an animal. What the werewolf's disease represents in the film is tricky. On the one hand, it may be simply a metaphor for exterior evil, the possessive capabilities of dark forces beyond our flesh. As the local folktale describes lycanthropy, it is a possession which can pierce even the men who are purest of heart and the most faithful servants of God which implies that every case of lycanthropy turns out the same. Every infected man is fated to become a murderous beast. But then again, the disease could also represent the animal nature of man, his lizard brain, so to speak. Perhaps the werewolf's disease is not purely a transmittable condition, but rather it requires a kind of willingness from its target. Which begs the question, does the disease compel every single man to the same bloodthirsty impulses, no matter how pure of heart he is? Or can a man learn to control it? As Larry goes on to murder multiple innocent people as the werewolf of the night, one has to wonder, is there any way he can control this? Surely he must play some part in allowing this to go on. Larry may very well be corrupted or impure in his heart of hearts, a man susceptible to the worst of the lycanthropy only because of his own tainted soul. He does, after all, continually pursue Gwen, a woman already engaged to another man. Isn't enough. Larry's lust is his most glaring character flaw, the only characteristic as consistent as his transformations into a werewolf. Notably, his initial infection occurs when walking Gwen through the woods and after learning of her engagement. When he later goes to kiss Gwen, they are interrupted by the commotion of the gypsies frantically packing up to escape what they hear is a local werewolf. Obviously, it's him. There's a clear relation between Larry's lust and his lycanthropy, which is only obviously portrayed at the very climax of the film, when Larry, in werewolf form, goes to attack Gwen. The moment in which Larry's manly lust and his animal aggressions merge into one being in one instant, and there is no longer a pretension of a decent man separate from the beast. That Larry is an unrepentant sinner, and the lycanthropy is his fitting curse, becomes a stronger case when considering the church scene. Once Larry has come to the conclusion that he is a monster, his father brings him along to a communal church service. But on his way there, he is nervous, unsociable, like somebody in the wrong body. 
He pinches his hat and his hands, doesn't look Gwen or her father in the eyes. Once they enter the church and everyone takes a seat in the pews, Larry just stands awkwardly at the back of the church, frozen in place and afraid to take a seat. The whole gathering looks back at him and he feels like an outsider. After the service begins, Larry jolts out of the church. Now, why does he do this? Despite his own personal concerns over his health, his mind, and his very soul, Larry nevertheless runs away from a potential cure, that cure being religion or God. It's notably odd that he does not even try to commune with a pastor or any man of faith. In a world where ancient superstition is real and lycanthropy manifests beyond mere delusion, then surely religion must have a legitimate real-world effect too. It's not out of the question that Larry could find aid in this holy place, but Larry does not pray. He does not ask for God's help. When frightened by an otherworldly circumstance, he doesn't even think to ask for the aid of an otherworldly father. This is where I question how much Larry really tries to solve his problem. Despite his possession, from which he cannot free himself but simply copes with, Larry purposefully avoids a resource for help. On the one hand, Larry is guilty for his crimes and afraid to confront that guilt, but also he may feel unworthy of salvation. In being forced into evil action by his disease, Larry has begun to identify with the evil now within him. Despite being half man, half beast, Larry treats himself as a full beast, unworthy of even the love of God. And so long as this is how Larry views himself, then he'll surely never be rid of his curse. He will never know whether he can be saved if he never tries. Larry is not so powerless as he would seem. Maybe the lycanthropy wins during the night, but during the day, it does not have to. Larry, in treating himself as a beast even while he is a man, chooses to identify with the evil. He lets it win. Rather than fight for the man who he is, he lets it go, runs away from religion, which might be his only shot at a cure. In this sense, there are two evils at play within Larry. That evil which forces him into nocturnal murder, and the evil which prevents him from seeking salvation. Larry's evil, like any evil, is not just found in action, but in his inaction. Choosing to do nothing for his disease while he has the time and the wit is as deplorable as any murder he unwillingly commits. At this point in the film, Larry, having given up on a solution, decides he will run away from the castle and the town to try and get himself far from people. His father tells him to stop believing in children's stories, and in order to prove to his son that the werewolf myth is just that, and the infamous killer is merely a stray wolf, he ties Larry to a chair prior to the night's hunting party. As Larry's father joins the other men in their hunt, he hears a strange howling from a distance. Running to the noise, he finds a real-life werewolf attacking Gwen in the forest. In a climactic struggle, he manages to best the beast, but in the moments after its death, the monster shapeshifts back into a man, Larry himself. As the film ends, it seems that the audience is supposed to pity Larry, to feel great sympathy for his plight, which he could have done nothing to stop. But a different and perhaps more valuable read is that Larry lost to evil on purpose. When haunted by fear of what he'd become and met with a religious resource for help, he denied the entire possibility of divine aid. Maybe a true cure would have been out of the question, nobody can know for sure. But perhaps Larry could have prayed could have searched his soul and gone right with God. In the immensity of his guilt, Larry may have simply felt overwhelmed, so he apologized for nothing, neither for his murder nor his lust. But had he confessed and prayed on his crimes, it's possible that his lycanthropy could have been cured. Surely, if the beast in him can so influence the man, then the man must have some say over the beast. If pure of heart enough, he may have been able to tame his beastly side. It was worth a shot, anyways. But when met with the chance, he turned and ran, and in this way, lost to evil of his own volition. It is one thing to commit an evil act, but it is another step altogether to make no effort toward salvation. Larry, who makes no effort, ultimately loses to the animal inside of him, an animal he in some sense allowed to take over. 
Go ahead and shoot before he bites you. If the Wolfman has a defining theme, it is that evil does not manifest purely through action, but likewise through inaction. A possessive evil does not only compel man towards depraved and dehumanizing crimes, but it equally implants in its targets a hesitation, and perhaps even an aversion, to salvation. The lycanthropy sends Larry into the dark and lawless woods without his say, but it would have far less power over him if it didn't also drive Larry away from the church and from God. Now you ask me if I believe a man can become a wolf. Well, if you mean can he take on the physical characteristics of an animal, no, it's fantastic. However, I do believe that most anything can happen to a man in his own mind. 